Hello, I've created this PowerPoint to hopefully simplify an article that I've written that will be published in the e-magazine. I'm going to take you through a Jungian reading of Carter's short story, The Bloody Chamber, the first one, um, and my reading of it is very much supported by a book called Women Who Run With Wolves, um, which is a book that explores the inner life of women and particularly the idea that women have a repressed wild woman internally that has been um, suffocated by centuries of compliance and patriarchy. The first part of this book explores Bluebeard. So I will be using quotes from um, Pincola Este's book as we go through. So let's start by looking at Jung's model of the self. Um, if you look closely at this diagram, you will see the shadow self at the bottom, the self in the middle and the ego at the top. And in the outer edges, you can see that the shadow exists in the collective unconscious, um, which is very much his idea that we all have archetypes within our unconscious minds and they all have something in similar in common, no matter where we come from or who we are. So Jung's idea that life is a journey towards individuation and that as we mature, we go through a process of integrating these darker aspects of ourselves from the unconscious mind. Um, in men, a very important archetype is the anima, which appears in dreams as a woman. And in a woman, it's the animus, which often appears as different kinds of men. Any man appears in a woman's dream can be classified as an archetype of the animus and different aspects of it. Um, these aspects in the shadow or in the unconscious are parts of ourselves that the ego cannot tolerate. They reject, we all reject aspects of ourselves and we push them into the unconscious mind. These are often the source material for fairy tales. Um, the archetypes become different characters within our unconscious. So an important point is that if you are thinking of using this reading in an essay, it's very important to define a Jungian reading first before you start exploring it. And I would suggest possibly the first sentence here on this slide, a Jungian method of analysis interprets each character in a story or dream as an archetype that exists in our collective unconscious. And then you can go on to explore um, and interpret the story. So in the bloody chamber, the marquee can be seen as the unconscious murderous masculinity of the protagonist or the pianist. Um, he is her sadistic animus. The blind piano tuner is an alternative, more sensitive masculine archetype and the mother is a strong female archetype. This is a good quote from um, Carter. Um, if you're dealing with any question that is related to the moral contents of the story, um, I do put everything to be read, read the way allegory was intended to be read. So she is seeing her own stories as allegory and inviting the reader to interpret them. Let's look in a little bit more detail at the Marquis as the animus archetype. Um, he embodies centuries of patriarchy. He has power and status as an aristocrat and the richest man in France. He lives in what the piano tuner describes as the castle of murder, where generations of ancestors are rumoured rumored to have indulged in aberrant behaviour. The Marquis is dead on the outside, a still, 
soundless presence with a concealed identity. The, pro the protagonist describes his face as being like a mask. This libertine only becomes animated during orgasm, and so he seeks out creative women who can give him life. He has a split between his deathly outer persona and his animalistic, primitive inner world. Like the protagonist, he is isolated and lonely. So in this way, Carter is exploring masculine sexuality as well as feminine sexuality. So this masculine archetype, the animus, um, is too powerful for her to stand up to. And she gets seduced by his promise of clothes and jewels and status. Um, and she acknowledges this, I'd sold myself to his fate. Now, psychologically, this is interesting. Um, Pincola Este clarifies all humans want to attain early paradise here on Earth. The problem is that ego desire to feel wonderful when combined with naivety makes us not fulfilled, but food for the predator. So she's 17, she's young, she comes from a poor family and she is naive um, and so she falls for the Marquis and she describes her own seduction. He stripped me, gourmand that he was, as if he was stripping the leaves off an artichoke. She's become a tasty morsel, objectified. He surrounds himself with pornographic art and literature that reinforces his values and shows the reader what she's up against, which is centuries of objectification and the admonishment of women. Carter's use of cultural and intertextual references reveals the historical depth and breadth of these sadistic visions of femininity. But this story is not as simple as an evil man and a good woman. Um, she realises that there is something in his toxic masculinity that needs rescuing. He re represents her dark shadow. Um, but there's something in it she needs in order to become a woman. She wants to know this part of herself, to claim her sexuality. And so she embarks on her journey to the chamber, explaining that she wants to find his real self. He awakens her sexuality through erotic objectification. The bedroom full of mirrors, his gallery for, full of pornography, sadistic works of art, dressing her up in uncomfortable designer outfits and a ruby choker, described as being like an extraordinary, precious slit throat. Carter is implying that if women define and learn about their bodies through the male gaze, the result is deathly. However, this is also an erotic awakening for her. So that's where the complication lies, is that she wants to inhabit her own sexuality, but only receives a sense of what that is through his gaze, um, and suggested that that happens to a lot of women, that their sense of self gets defined by men rather than by themselves finding their own sense of um, eroticism internally. So when the Marquise shows her the painting, she acknowledges her feelings. And she says, and as at the opera, when I had first seen my flesh in his eyes, I was aghast to feel myself stirring. So she is now on a journey to claim her own sexuality by confronting the toxic animus within her. The protagonist's desire to find the truth behind the passive exterior of her husband is her motivation for opening the door with the forbidden key. This aspect of the story is mirrored in Bluebeard. Pincola Este writes, the key represents the deepest, darkest secrets of the psyche, 
Bluebeard forbids the young woman to use the one key that would bring her to consciousness. In Jungian terms, the protagonist wants to integrate the shadow part of herself and claim her sexual and creative energy, so she sets off on the heroine's journey and goes down into the unconscious mind, past the still room, through the dark passage, into his soul. The dungeon, or den, is a powerful Jungian symbol. And Este writes, the cellar, dungeon and cave symbols are all related to one another. They're the ancient initiation, initiatory environs, places to or through which a woman descends to the murdered ones, breaks taboos to find the truth, and through wit and or travail triumphs by banishing, transforming or exterminating the assassin of the psyche. So obviously in this case, another part of her psyche emerges a uh, female mother, strong archetype, um, who kills this aspect of the psyche. When she goes inside the chamber, she sees that his soul is murderous, that this kind of masculinity makes women terminally passive. She learns how this toxic masculinity has tortured the feminine and embalmed it, preserving the bodies as preserved trophies. So we're going to look now at um, the blind piano tuner and the mother and how they work as archetypes in her um, unconscious. So there is a redemptive quality to the end of the story, but a very different kind of redemption than the one in Perrault's Bluebeard. In Perrault's Bluebeard, um, Freud suggests that the tale is a psychological punishment for women's sexual curiosity. So the tale works as a warning against curiosity and Carter's um, message is the opposite. It seems to me that she's suggesting that curiosity and facing the darkness is what will bring redemption. The piano tuner is Carter's invention He's symbolic of a different kind of masculinity, a more positive, sensitive animus archetype. He's blind, so his love for her is based on his love of her creativity, an expression of her inner world, her virtuoso piano playing. Carter implies that this is a better basis for a heterosexual relationship and can heal the psyche. He's poor, the son of a blacksmith, and perhaps for Carter as a socialist, he belongs to a more authentic world. He can value her for her inequalities rather than want to own her as a beautiful possession like the Marquis does. However, she's not saved by him, but by a strong feminine archetype, another Carter invention. She's a mother who had outfaced a junk full of Chinese pirates and is brave enough to face and kill toxic masculinity again. In psychoanalytic terms, she represents the force within all women that can act when it is time to kill off destructive impulses. The young heroine is also saved by her ability to see the horror and not look away and can therefore integrate an aspect of her shadow. So this powerful, um, terrifying Gothic story has a happy ending. It presents a different model for a heterosexual relationship and a transformation of the castle of murder into a school for the blind. It's a socialist vision of sharing wealth and caring for the less fortunate. Carter claimed that all her writing was strongly political and this story is a direct criticism of capitalism, patriarchal values and perhaps more importantly a playful, disturbing allegory for inner transformation and female liberation. Perrault's heroine, by contrast, is rescued by her brothers and having inherited Bluebeard's money, reinstates the patriarchal status quo by paying for them to become captains in the army, for her sisters to marry young gentlemen and to find herself a suitable husband. 
So the patriarchal status quo is maintained in Bluebeard in Perrault's version. Carter subverts this traditional moral ending and presents a dynamic, if perilous, vision of hope for women. She's not suggesting that the journey is easy. Uh, the protagonist has a new, authentic life, but still one in which she has to live with the ironically heart-shaped stain of the Marquis placed on her forehead like a cast mask as a lifelong reminder of her experience. She doesn't want to present the idea of transformation as easy, and this is true in all her stories. She has a new life in which she is strong enough to be immune to gossip because she claims the three of us know the truth of it. And the truth for Carter is redemptive and transformative. <laughs>